We are going through interesting and devilish times, for sure. Whichever way one looks at the world right now, one sees that the psychic glue that is holding society in a civilization at this moment is fear. Of course, I am not only well aware of the inherent inaccuracies of generalizations, but I also am aware that I am, myself, not excluded from such human issues and emotional temptations. Not at all. I am but a man like you, or woman if that's your case, or Apache attack helicopter to avoid any offensive misidentification. Still, general observations are not only useful, but necessary to contemplate upon. Because the world we live in is made up of rules and tendencies, and these rules and tendencies are generalized. So it is observable that, on the one hand, some fear becoming sick and dying, as if that's some kind of novelty in the world somehow, while others fear the societal changes and their consequences enforced and consented by those who follow the fear of becoming sick or dying as if those consequences hadn't been in the oven, so to speak, and foreseen for who knows how long. The first fear losing their biological lives, first and foremost, and so are willing to consent to anything in exchange for a fatherly promise to survive, even if a false one. The latter fear losing their lifestyles, as if, for most, again, the danger of generalization, they had been leading morally acceptable ways of life. The fear of the first group is the most basic program that rules this world, sheer survival at all costs. The fear of the second group, however, shows more elevated concerns. However, it also shows an attachment to a way of life as if it had been led with high moral standards. I would like to contemplate and examine some of its aspects. Some affirm that democracy is under threat, for example. This is either willing or involuntary blindness, because first there is no democracy in the world right now, and if there ever really was, it has been lost already long before this subject became trendy. And second, because contrarily to a sort of agreed-upon consensus, democracy does not mean more freedom. If one considers freedom as an absence of the tyranny of evil. It has been previously addressed in a contemplation note named exactly democracy that the leader or ruling power always represents the moral state of their people. If that is the case, then the fact that the majority has the ability to choose who the leader is even if one was to consider that elections have no fraud ever, and that anyone could come forth as a candidate with any organic and authentic chance, means that the people is already morally divided. And not only divided, mind you, but so much divided that it requires the voting in the first place. Of course, in society there is never a true mental consensus, nor should there ever be. Plurality of opinion is extremely healthy and important for a mankind that aims at any kind of reconnection to beyond this foggy existence. After all, we are not all one, but individual manifestations. However, true moral consensus is absolutely essential for that same goal. Regardless of one's religious views, or lack thereof, there are fundamental true moral pillars that are timeless, always self-evident, and objective enough to be adaptable to our mundane relative contexts. So the substrate from where democracy sprouts is moral relativism. And no, again, I am not talking about a specific moral table given by one specific culture or religion, but am referring to that timeless morality that we all, when quiet enough, when centered enough, can access as self-evident truth from beyond the fog of worldly life. So this moral relativism serves as the basis for a system of government that, 
even though it offers an external image of a good, freedom-respecting societal regime, is nothing but a petri dish for the growth and coming forth of evil shadows. But these shadows didn't feed themselves, nor did they come about by chance. They reflect exactly that lack of true moral compass that was addressed previously. After all, false light will always cast a shadow. Only true light can dissolve and prevent them. So it is preferable to have a true moral ruler, that is, the first servant to their people, than to have a choice from among a set of false ones. And it has to be understood that shadows can only reflect that which is already false. For instance, it is morally true that a sense of family circles is an essential true human need. Hence the concept of family itself being under attack for quite a long time now. Yet being under attack does not mean that it will be successfully destroyed. After all, shadows are but reflections and tests to our moral alignment. I will repeat something I had stated in a previous contemplation. The solution to the world puzzle is a moral one. The fact is that families are being destroyed successfully for so long exactly because they have been but empty facades of previous truer living foundational monuments. Shadows can only kill that which is weak and dying anyway, because that is all they can access. A shadow can only consume shadow food, like contemplated previously in Metaphors of Tumors. If one fails to look authentically at the core cause for all these successful destruction campaigns, and is simply left hating the shadows for being the demonic influences they were created to be, we will have missed two important soul-changing points. One is that they only successfully destroyed that which was no longer held as true or sacred, but had been allowed to become a mere mechanistic way of life. And the other is that it was ourselves who somewhere along the line decided that feeding the shadows tempting whispers and influences was of more value to us than feeding what they were convincing us to attack and destroy along with them. Moral choice. And family here is merely an example and is applicable to any other element. You see, worship is gratitude. That is what it is at its core. If one worships devils, one is being grateful for the influence and whatever worldly advantages they brought. That aligns oneself to death and death can be consumed. Inversely, if one worships that which is true and living, beyond relativity and subjectivity, in one's own daily life, those symbols, then one is being grateful to truth in life, thus discarding the temptations for death. So we are now being faced with the product not only of our lack of alignment with true morality, but our active or passive participation into these shadow whispers, which fed them and starved that which we stopped regarding as sacred to us, but now have ample opportunity to review. For example, Catholics have this concept of venial sin, which is a forgivable minor transgression that does not cause the connection to God to be cut. However, in the Catholic view, venial sins can slowly and gradually move a soul towards a deadly sin. Using that template, I can observe that it was a sort of accumulation of venial sins, or of several minor karmas, if that is your preferred language, that led to the death of that which was sacred, but we didn't feed enough, or even turned our backs on, and allowed to die 
at its core. The shadows now are merely consuming the empty shell of families, not their core, because the core of a true moral family is life, and true life is inaccessible and even corrosive to shadows. And again, family here is just an example among many I could quote. So in essence, we ourselves starved the concept of family to death, as we heard the tempting whispers, accepted them, and allowed their sacredness to be extinguished, due to lack of worship, as mentioned before, and I repeat, worship is gratitude. One can even interchangeably use both words as synonyms. Yet this is, as dark as it is, an opportunity time to reevaluate that which is true and living for ourselves, that which is sacred, but we allow to die amidst us. After all, suffering shakes us up so much as humans that it can only catch our attention. And when we are all forced to stop, it is what we contemplate and conclude about our lives up to then that truly changes anything. And that is always an individual process. You can only do it for yourself. No one else can tell you what is or isn't sacred. After all, in the Christian myth, Jesus was killed after being betrayed and even denied by his followers, perhaps because they weren't grateful enough for his wisdom. Yet he resurrected afterwards, after they were given the opportunity to see and reevaluate how sacred that wisdom and truth and life was for them, the true master. Once they saw him again living, they never again strayed from being grateful for what was truly of importance in their world, this transcending truth. As I had also addressed previously, myths, outlines, always convey truth more accurately than their detailing words. After all, you guessed it, truth speaks no words. <laughs>